Good morning. Welcome all. Good day to the fourth uh, session of subsidence uh, and information. Uh, my name is uh, Gine Ketelaar and together with uh, Giovanni Nico, I will be chairing uh, this session. Um, I hope you're all fresh on the last day of, uh, of, uh, of French, um, because we have some very interesting presentations uh, coming up. And uh, we'll introduce the first one. And the first uh, presenter is uh, Teng Wang from uh, Peking University. And uh, he will start with uh, a presentation on deep learning facilitated local deformation monitoring with large scale SAR interferometry. Okay, can I start? Yes, please go okay. ahead. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. And uh, hello, everyone. And today I'm going to talk about the work conducted in our SAR Imaging Geodesy Group at Peking University about deep learning facilitate local deformation monitoring with large scale SAR interferometry. And now we, we have stepped it in the big data area of SAR interferometry, particularly because thanks to the open data policy of the ESA 1701 mission, now we are actually acquiring a large amount of images uh, every day and uh, to, to achieve the large scale application. And also many AI technologies has been introduced in the SAR interferometry. For example, now we have, a, a, we have, now we have more satellites and a shorter repeating times and higher resolutions. Here, for example, one track across the uh, Tibetan plateau, we have more than 1,000 images. And uh, actually now we have more images we can uh, efficiently process uh, than we acquire. So we have a lot of images we need to manage. And for the big data, uh, we, we, we need a data manager system to manage our images and the results. We also need a parallelized algorithm to uh, speed up our inside processing steps and also we need to build up our system in a distributed computer, uh, computing infrastructures to, to, uh, to finish the large scale uh, processing. So here in our group, we developed a burst based uh, CPU parallelized inside processor that can efficiently process large scale Sentinel-1 star images. And uh, here is one example from a single, uh, from a, a pair of SLC images to a geocoded coded interferogram. They uh, take only three minutes and 10 minutes, uh, and 10 seconds with a uh, 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 eight core uh, CPU. And even uh, with such processing uh, capability, now we can get very large scale interferograms. For example, here is a, a interferogram across the south, uh, from the North India to the South, uh, uh, to uh, to Xinjiang province in China across the whole uh, Tibetan plateau, and with with such large scale interferograms, actually we are interested in two kinds of signals. One is a long wavelength deformation signal, such as tectonic motion and uh, coastal deformation, and another thing is a local deformation that is sparsely distributed in a large scale interferograms. For example, active landslides or mining subsidence or sinkholes. So uh, today in, in my talk, I will focus on how we can more efficiently handle this local deformation <coughs> in a uh, large scale interferometry. And here for, uh, for such local uh, deformation signals, here is an example of uh, mining act, uh, of the subsidence caused by the mining activity. We can see they have uh, distributed, sparsely distributed in the interferograms. So we propose to uh, firstly, prepare a stack of interferograms efficiently and masking out decoration areas. Here we also use uh, deep learning to, to get the mask. Uh, we, we, are, we already showed this in our poster uh, several days, uh, two days ago, I think. And here in my talk, I will focus on two things. One is uh, how, to we, how can we detect such local deformation patterns from the rapid interferogram? And the second thing is how we can handle uh, face uh, unwrapping such uh, uh, local deformation with very high uh, fringe, high density fringes. And then we, I will also show some time series results. So here, the first uh, application field is the mining subsidence. And here is an example in Shanxi province in China that is famous for coal mining. 
And here we use four frames of Sentinel One images acquired in one year, covering about 180 uh, 100 kilometer square. And we try to uh, detect all the uh, local subsidence caused by mining, mining activity and try to get the time series deformation. And here we see some example uh, of interferograms and the unwrapping results using snaf We can see when the deformation is, uh, the gradient of deformation is high and fringe is dense, it's very difficult to correctly unwrap such interferograms and uh, usually it can underestimate the deformation. So here we propose a, a deep learning network to solve this unwrapping problem. And we firstly uh, set up our training data set with a, uh, with a distorted Gaussian, Gaussian surface to simulate the menu, menu induced uh, local deformation. And then we add Pauline noises to simulate the atmospheric delays and also add declaration noises to form uh, 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 10, 000, more than 10,000 of uh, simulated interferograms as a training set. With the training set, we, we can have the true face values and the uh, simulated interferograms. Then we can train our network to learn the pattern of such deforma uh, such ranges. And with the output of one is the output is the uh, unwrapped face, and another output is the probability of such local deformation. So after training this network, uh, we, we can get, first we get the DDNet try to de uh, use to, to detect such local deformation with such, such uh, certain fringe patterns. And this is a, a detection result from a single interferogram. We can see it de uh, successfully detect most of the uh, subsidence patterns produced by the menu activities. And if we detect, uh, uh, we use this network to detect uh, such uh, uh, such subsidence centers from a stack of interferograms and stack them together, we can get a, a more reliable detection result. And after detection, we will try to unwrap such interferograms with, with our uh, network. And here is uh, uh, our unwrapping results validated on simulated uh, test sets. And we can see with the uh, interferogram with uh, such fringes, when the uh, signal to noise level is high, and uh, our network can predict the true, uh, true phase, close to the true phase, also the gamma software and the SNAP software. But when the deformation gradient or the fringe is more complicated and more dense, our network still predict uh, uh, basically the same thing as a true phase, but uh, if we use traditional phase unwrapping method from the gamma software or SNAP, we began to underestimate the deformation. And uh, when the noise level is high, it even cannot uh, recover the, defo the deformation signal. And uh, we also uh, did a, a reliability uh, assessment that we simulate interferograms with uh, same patterns, but different uh, gradients with different noise levels. So here is four examples. One is a very uh, smooth deformation and then a small noise level. And here is a smooth deformation with very large noise level and also high deformation gradient with, uh, uh, with small noise level. And uh, this is a high gradient with large noise level. So we, we simulated uh, 4,206 uh, interferograms and use our network to unwrap it and uh, to try to uh, test the reliability of our result. And here is uh, the result with X, uh, X uh, axis is a, a maximum deformation gradient. And here is a standard deviation of the unwrapping arrow, and here are the peak arrows. We can see that when the noise level is low, we can, our network can even recover the phase uh, with very high phase uh, deformation gradient. And uh, this, this capability decreases when the noise level is higher. But in any case, uh, the network can recover a much uh, a difficult case than the traditional phase unwrapping method can do. And we also uh, validate our results with a, true, with a real data set, Sentinel-1 uh, data in the field realms. And uh, since we, we, we don't know the ground truth, we use another way to uh, validate our results. So we use a 12 day, uh, 24 day, and 36 and uh, 48 day in field realms. And then we unwrap the field realms and we rewrap it again to see 
and uh, the if the deformation is uh, uh, increasing with the time linearly. So we assume that the deformation is linearly changing in this short period. So our results show the increasing uh, deformation pattern from our uh, wrapping results using our deep learning network. But if you use SNAFU to unwrap it, and after for the 36 or 48 day interferograms, you will see that uh, it's highly underestimate the deformation. So we also validate our results with LS2 uh, interferograms because LS2 has a longer wavelength. Will, we can uh, easily unwrap it uh, with traditional method. So we use our uh, network to unwrap Sentinel-1 interferograms and compare with LS2 interferograms. It shows a very good cons uh, consistent result. So finally, we applied our network to first detect uh, more than 1,000 locations of such uh, local subsidence and then the analysis of all the interferograms uh, and unwrap it uh, on this small area with our network to retrieve the uh, time series deformation of all these uh, local subsidence. And we can see that the deformation velocity, <coughs> the velocity we derived is much larger than it can be derived from uh, stamps with uh, SNAF photo uh, unwrapping method. So the deformation ma uh, maximum deformation velocity is more than two meters per year, actually. It's very large. <clears throat> and uh, we also plotted the time series uh, result to show that when the deformation gradient is larger, the traditional methods, uh, or no matter gamma software or snuff will underestimate the deformation. And uh, this is from our result. And from this uh, uh, movie, we also show that this to the deformation time series actually show the direction of the manual activity. So the subsidence is propagating from west uh, to east. Okay, the second application is uh, active landslides. Like for landslides, the deformation is much smaller than the manual induced uh, uh, deformation. So from a single interferograms, actually we cannot see anything, but uh, we, think we, we use another method that we add we stack all the phase gradient of all the short tempo baseline interferograms to make a phase gradient map. And from this phase gradient map, we see a clear pattern that uh, red and blue pattern from the phase gradient in elements in the range to show the local deformation area. Then we, tra <coughs> we, we, we train the network Yolo, uh, Yolo V3 to detect such patterns and find the, the active location of landslide. And here, this is a Yolo V3 network structure. And from the uh, network, we can easily detect a lot of active landslides from this phase gradient map. And com compare with uh, uh, PS INSA and the uh, phase stacking method, we see it's much, uh, we detect uh, much more uh, active landslides than traditional method. And we applied this method to the uh, also about uh, uh, 180, 100 kilometers square, we detect uh, uh, close to 4,000 active landslides. And it takes only 48 hours from SLC to the detection result. So to conclude, uh, a fast uh, INSA processor is highly needed now. And also we propose for the such local deformation pattern, we detect first and then we do the time series analysis. And also deep learning network is very useful and in large scale science foundry. Thank you. Uh, thank you thank very you. much for your presentation. Um, before I uh, uh, move over, um, I would like to uh, remind the audience if you have any questions, uh, please uh, put them into the, the Slido uh, uh, box. And um, moving on mm. to the second presentation, I will give the word to my uh, co chair, Giovanni Nico. Thank you, Guinea. And uh, before passing to the next uh, presentation, probably we can also remind that uh, 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 audience can also people can also interact uh, between uh, among them uh, using the chat if they if they wish. So uh, now we move to the next presenter. Uh, the presentation will be given by Giovanni Quazzo from uh, URAC Research Italy. Please, Giovanni.
Okay, you have the problem. Okay. Thank you. Can you see the slides? Mm, still not. Yes, maybe now. Okay. Uh, Thank yes, you yes. for the introduction. Okay. I will start the presentation with uh, showing you the objectives of this work, which are the monitoring of the slow slope movement in South Tyrol based on the SAR techniques. Regarding the area of interest, uh, the South Tyrol is located in the northern part of Italy at the boundary more or less with uh, Switzerland and Austria, and is characterized by a mountainous region with a very high spatial heterogeneity. And there we selected two test areas. One uh, is a rock glacier, another one is a landslide landforms, landform. They are characterized by different uh, spatial extent type of phenomena, the entity of the movement and also the soil characteristics, uh, like, uh, for example, the presence of absence of vegetation and also from uh, the altitude. The consequence is that uh, to do an effective uh, monitoring of these uh, phenomena are needed the different that data different in terms of uh, resolution, spatial uh, and temporal, and also different techniques. Moreover, we implemented and tested at regional scale a technique for updating a rock glacier inventory. Starting from the first test area, this is the Lazaon rock glacier, you can see on the right, which is a medium sized active rock glacier located in Valsenales in the western part of the South Tyrol that moves downstream due to the deformation of internal ice. The extent of the area is not so big for an uh, interferometric application in 0.5, 0.12 uh, square kilometers. And the uh, speed rates vary from, goes from 1 to 0.4.5 millimeters per day. Here, the data that we used, we uh, had the possibility to plan and acquire the six starting spotlight terrasatex on this area at very high resolution, less than one meter in ascending mode, and uh, we had the possibility to select uh, the uh, mode and the beam that uh, had the, be the best incident angle for the area, for the topography of interest. Mm -hmm. so with this data, we did several uh, processing uh, to monitor annual, interannual, and uh, short-term displacement, short-term at 11, 12, 32 days, uh, which are the temporal resolution of the data. And we also we use the central one, the ascending and descending tracks for a short time displacement, six days in this case. We also have some other data part of satellite data, some measurement, GPS measurement that are taken from 2006 from the University of Innsbruck. And also we did some campaigns with ground-based SAR and we applied also DINSAR here to monitor, to monitor the uh, displacement a very short term. Some results we have uh, uh, for TerraSerX data and uh, results at one year of temporal resolution using amplitude tracking. On the right, you can see the velocity map in almost uh, one year, 363 days. The color showed the uh, entity of the movement, the black arrows, the uh, direction, direction shown by the amplitude tracking obtained by the amplitude tracking and the blue arrows are, are obtained differently from the GPS measurements. Considering that uh, we assume that the velocity is parallel to the surface on the left side in the plot, you can see the uh, comparison between GPS and SAR velocity in different components and we have good agreement in all the components. Here we have a, a test that we did with, with uh, 11 days of temporal resolution with two TerraSerX images. The, the figure has similar behavior, the same behavior. The different, main difference in this case is that obviously uh, the north-south component is less accurate in this case is due to the inherent limitation of the TINSAR technique. And again, here is a, said an example obtained with the ground-based SAR. We did some campaign in uh, two year, different years. Uh, the duration of this campaign is more or less 10, 15 days. In this case, 
is nine days in uh, 2018. And again, we had the possibility to, to have a, a displacement map with the same meaning before, illustrated before. And the results of the comparison with the GPS that was performed, the GPS campaign contextual to the, this uh, ground based SAR campaign on the left side. Here is a, just a simple uh, graph where we put together results obtained with, with the three different techniques on the uh, horizontal axis, the time, and the vertical axis, the velo velocity reprojected. And we can uh, note that in both here, we have an increasing of the velocity uh, in the end of the summer period. So we uh, monitor, have the possibility to monitor the are in the summer period in the snow-free period. This is a, has also meaning, obviously. And uh, here I go with the results with the Sentinel-1 data analysis. In this case, we uh, process the data with the DSAR. We have a good agreement between interferometry and GPS measurements, considering the time resolution of six days in both ascending and ascending mode. When we go to uh, temporal resolution, for example, 12 days or more, we start, start have a starting to have some problem of the correlation in this area. Considering both, uh, for, considering in particular the, the entity of the movement. We used also this bus. Again, we get a good agreement, got a good agreement between interferometry and GPS mes measurement, in this case, especially for slower displacement. Again, the problem uh, for faster displacement rates are the correlation and the wrapping problems. Also, because uh, we have uh, in one year uh, about uh, three months uh, that are snow free, and then we have some problem to get a complete uh, stack of data uh, that are useful for this bus processing. This is the other landform. In this case, is the uh, landslide uh, in the area of Corvara, which is uh, studied since uh, many years by non not only for, by our groups group. The, this landslide is a deep seated rotational air flow that is characterized by three morphological sector. You have a SARS zone that is uh, which is on the on the right and in the eastern part, a track zone in the center, and the accumulation zone. On the left, or the figure that you can see below, on the on the left, the surface area is bigger respect to the other test area. We have 2.5 square kilometers, and the slow deformation varies from goes from a few centimeters per year up to tens meters per year. In the Lazar regulation, we have a, can arrive to one a little bit more than one meter per year. In this area, we have installed also some corner reflectors. There are sort of corner reflectors uh, uh, with dimension adapted to C band and other for X band. And uh, this uh, corner reflector has been uh, controlled and reoriented in correspondence to the uh, overpasses of the satellite RSRX data. On the right, uh, you can see a uh, figure that show the corner reflector and the uh, overview of, of the area. Again, we have the possibility to plan and acquire Terra Serex data, in this case only three data, always a sp starting spotlight, very high resolution, one per year in 2016, 17 and 18. The sending mode, again, we selected the best uh, incidence angle for the area. This data we used only for amplitude tracking, not for simple interferometry because for presence also of vegetation there are the correlation that uh, is too strong for X band data. Then we also use the Sentinel-1 data in ascending and descending track and we implement, we perform some uh, processing with this bus. This is an example of the very high resolution uh, image, image obtained with Terrasarex data on the land slide. You can see also here this, the town on the left and the presence of vegetation is highlighted. This is an, ex an example of result with this bus. This is a, a, a projection on the horizontal plane, and we have the 
we can see here the landslide go westwards and the greatest displacement occurred in the southern part of the SARS zone, that is the blue area here on the, on the right, and in the track zone in the middle. We have also time series of deformation with three points collected in three different areas. And we have again that uh, the high displacement, the high rates displacement uh, occurs occur in the uh, track zone and the, in the SARS zone, in that area of the SARS zone. The very new thing in this project for this area is the, the use of the amplitude tracking with the X band data at a very high resolution. In this case, uh, the problem was obviously again related to the uh, presence of vegetation and the related to the correlation. Then we get not so many measuring points in the area of the landslide. In particular, we have the points uh, related to the corner reflectors and also some uh, natural scatters. But in this point, the uh, measurement uh, is really accurate in both azimuth and slant range direction. Here we have an example also with difference of two years between the two acquisition TerraSarex data. And the last uh, point is related to the rock glacier inventory. I'll go quite faster because this is already recently pu published. We have uh, an existing inventory in, on the South Tyrol where it distinct uh, distinction between active land, active rock glacier and inactive and relic rock glacier. We used the, uh, implemented the SAR uh, unsupervised method. The, dis the distinction is between the moving and no moving landform, but this large spatial area is based principally on the coherence and, par and parameter of coherence. I don't go in detail in the flow chart, but the main it's point- three minutes. Yeah, <laughs> are that we selected the uh, pre filtering when we selected the, the best orbit, uh, uh, relative orbit with the less layover shadowing and vegetation presence. Then the two main uh, parameters were was the difference in the backscattering in the area and also the uh, coherence, and then a classification based on expectation maximization algorithm. And then the results uh, are quite good for this kind of uh, inventory. And also we have the information confirming that at higher altitude, there are more moving uh, rock glacier. This is the validation that is done in uh, independent uh, inventory in the closest area of the Strentino. Finally, the conclusion and the outlook can say regarding rock glacier uh, of LUT sound at very high resolution Terra SRX data perform well with denser amplitude tracking. Sentinel one can detect movements considering temporal resolution of six days, that's a problem with more than six days sometimes. Difficult to obtain an optimal data stacking, there's no pre period for multi temporal interferometry. Then both denser and GPS measurements show the velocity increasing during the last part of the summer 2017 and 18. And then for the outlook, the opportunity interesting was to monitor in, with the multiband data, in particular the L band and the new generation of Cosmos Sky data. For Corvara, again, we have the amplitude tracking works well for annual, but not only a few points can be used for measurements. The DINSAR can be used to detect displacement with some limitation related to the rates of displacement of the vegetation. The ideal solution also, uh, is also in this case the opportunity to get multi frequency data, the presence of SARL band data with a high temporal resolution. In this case, also ROSEL is in this perspe perspective optimal. You know, regarding rock glacier inventory, you know, the automatic method has been implemented and tested, and the multi frequency approach can also be useful in this case. I will thank for your att attention. I just mentioned that this work is uh, related to the project Alps Motion funded by the province of Bolsano. They are the partner of the project in the acknowledgement for the data and measurement that we use during this project. This can conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, the first questions are, are coming. Uh, we will ask, we will invite authors to answer the questions uh, at the end of the session. Now, Guinea, back to you for introducing uh, the next presenter.
Yes, uh, thank you. Um, we continue with uh, with the third uh, presentation of this morning um, by uh, Karsten uh, Spaans from uh, Satsense. And uh, he will give a presentation on uh, Satsense ground movement data, UK-wide up-to-date measurements of ground motion for industry applications. Please go ahead, Karsten. Yes, thank you, Fini. I'm still waiting for my share button. I believe Giovanni is still sharing. So if you could stop, maybe I could start. Oh, sorry. Um, so my name is Kars Spaans. I work for Satsense Indeed, a UK-based company. And today I would like to introduce to you our UK-wide um, data product. Um, talk about how we how we process things, how we handle uh, this data set, this large data set, and the kind of things we do with it. Work here, presenting here as a result of work done by, by the entire SetSense team, as shown here. Um, so I will, in this talk, I'll cover a, a I'll, I'll skim over how we how we process it. Um, I will neither go very in depth on the technical side. I can't go in too in depth on the applications, but hopefully enough to give you a flavor of the kind of things we do and provide you an overview of the kind of things happening in the UK and this sort of applications for INSAR that are uh, coming up because of this uh, this data set we have. So SetSense spin-off company from the University of Leeds. I've been going for three years now, which seems like a long time, but believe me, it has flown by. Um, our focus is very much uh, initially on the UK market, although we do have inter international product projects. And our main focus is Sentinel-1 data um, because of its, its operational nature and its, its, its cost, uh, its, its non-existent costs in terms of data. Uh, although we do occasionally use high resolution data, but that's not going to be part of this, this presentation. We're a small team, we're expanding um, uh, quickly though. Uh, we're actually hiring. So if you're an INSAR person looking for a job, we really want to hear from you. Please contact us. And at SetSense, um, what we believe is that, that INSAR uh, will be um, a core part of, of a geotechnical and asset monitoring um, in, in the next few years. We see an increase in, in industry uptake in, in, in recent years, but we believe there's still quite some way to go. And the way we, we try to, to um, expedite and facilitate this is, is by making the data more cost effective. A price in the end is, is an important driver for, for uptake of this data. Um, instant availability. Uh, so we, we want to lower, the, this goes towards lowering the threshold of using this data. Um, if people have to order the data, wait for it to be processed, and then weeks later they get the product, it's a lot higher the threshold than having the data instantly available by logging into a, a portal, uh, clicking on, on your area of interest and being able to see the data and download the data right away. Uh, we keep our data up to date, so we, we aim to have our data out within, within days after acquisition. Well, we aim to have it out quicker than that, but at the moment we, so we're talking about days. And um, we believe we, there's still a long way to go to make INSAR data easier to use, interpret, and integrate into, into people's workflow. INSAR data is not intuitive to use to most non-expert users, and we believe we can still make progress there in making it easier to use and easier to, uh, to interpret. Um, so I'll start off with a little bit uh, of background on our processing. How do we handle this data? What does the data product look like? So we have this UK-wide uh, data product, Sentinel-1 data, processed in full resolution. We have full coverage in both ascending and descending. So we don't resample to a, a grid, downsample our data. All of the data points are displayed as is. Uh, we process our data as fast as we can. So uh, we, aim, uh, we aim to have it as quick as possible. Like I said, uh, on average about two to three days after acquisitions, it's available. We have 700 million measurement points currently over the UK. And all this leads to this, uh, this uh, lower threshold up-to-date data set that's available to the clients instantly. They can sit behind their desk, get a new project, and are able to log into our website, to, to our data portal, and see their area where they want to build something or where an event has happened, and be able to see what happened there last week, all the way back to 2015. Um, so how do we progress this in terms of software algorithms? Um, so the informative part is, is off the shelf, we use Gamma. 
Um, so that includes everything up until the topographically corrected wrapped interferograms. And the rest is developed uh, by algorithms, uh, but it, the rest is done by algorithms developed in-house, um, except for the unwrapping, which is done using uh, Snafu, although we do tinker with the costs to avoid some of the um, some of the unwrapping errors we saw in, in earlier presentations. Um, time series are invariant using sps like approach, although we do a, a, a robust pre-selection of the points based on sibling-based coherence. So sibling-based coherence is a way of getting a much sharper individual coherence estimates. We do this by uh, using ensemble of points uh, of similar, uh, similar neighboring points. So instead of just using a rectangular uh, box car, like you see in the top right there, it leads to a quite grainy result. If you use only similar points in your ensemble, you get a much sharper result. Uh, what that allows you to do is um, it allows you to add very quickly uh, new images towards the end of your time series and it gives you a, a robust variable point selection time so you don't have to worry about your network selection skipping winter acquisitions worry about uh, points that might appear and disappear over time that's all handled by the by the algorithm uh, itself um, and then we finish up with some post-processing, which is many consists of atmospheric phase screen removal, and we have to deal with uh, the phase bias, which has been covered quite extensively over this um, over this uh, this fringe meeting. Uh, we definitely see it in our data in the UK over certain types of ground cover, particular pasture lands and, and moorlands. Uh, we see quite heavily consistent subsidence signals in our um, in our data, which are not real, which are caused by this phase bias. In terms of hardware, how do we process this on? It's all run on dedicated uh, processing hardware by our provider. Um, reasonable amount of processing cores and ridiculous amount of memory required for this processing. Um, to mitigate some of these memory requirements, we use SSD scratch space to handle um, the, the per, this, this input output and memory limitations. So as soon as you start processing lots of scenes in parallel, uh, we start ha having lots of heavy disk operations at the same time. And uh, traditional disks have trouble handling this. So we use a lot of SSD space to, to help with that. Long-term storage is on normal, spare, uh, normal spinning disks, several hundred terabytes of it uh, over the last six years. And all of this is, is run uh, by an automated daemon, uh, which handles everything from detecting new images being entered into the ESA archive to the downloading to job creation, prioritization, and also uh, resource, resource uh, monitoring. Uh, so ensuring not too many heavy memory jobs or heavy disk write jobs are running at the same time. This is all done automatically and um, running without too much human input. Moving on to some uh, some data examples uh, of the UK. Uh, first off, uh, the town of Ventnor. Ventnor is on the Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight is an island just to the south of the UK. Uh, big tourist destination in the UK. Beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful destination. Uh, but like a lot of UK, a coastline suffers from uh, from landslips, and Ventnor is a town that's built on top of these uh, cliffs that are that are slipping, leading to damage to infrastructure and property. Uh, landslip clearly visible in the data. Um, so top right is ascending data, bottom right is uh, is the descending data. Um, Movement signals visible both uh, data sets with opposing signs, so there's a significant horizontal component to this uh, to this movement, as you would expect from a landslide. This landslide is uh, fairly continuous, as you can see from the time history. Um, continuous movement over the last six years, certainly, with an indication of a speed up in recent year. And if you take it a bit further, you can do a horizontal and vertical decomposition which uh, shows um, vertical, oh, sorry, horizontal movement eastwards. Um, in reality, it movement slightly southeast towards the sea, but we invert it here for the, for the eastward component of it. And the vertical movement shows substance at the top of the glyph and a bit of heave at the toe of the land slip where it is locked and starting to push up the land uh, below it. So the way this, this data is, is useful to industry is uh, as we work with um, Home insurance uh, companies and, and home buyer reports uh, companies 
that, uh, that want to know for the risk of building damage and uh, the ground movement substance is a big driver into that. So we sell our data to these, uh, these companies. Another property example on slightly smaller scale, um, sinkholes is the city of Ripon in the north of England, quite close to where, quite close to Leeds, where we are. Um, news article here again about a Sainsbury's being evacuated. Sainsbury's is a large uh, supermarket chain in the UK. So uh, looking at our data, uh, the Sainsbury's supermarket here is outlined in yellow, single locations indicated by the arrow. In the top right, you can see our normal ground movement point-based data. Um, probably not very clear at this scale. I apologize for that, but there is there is substance visible in that data around the location of the sinkhole. In the bottom left panel, you can see uh, one of our derived products, which is a um, long-term movement trend um, over over the area, which clearly shows this this area as a movement hotspot. And the bottom right panel shows the time history for one of the points closest to the sinkhole, which shows some preliminary movement leading up to the sinkhole indicated by the red line, and a distinct and a large amount of movement after the sinkhole happens. Um, this is uh, relevant because this sinkhole actually opened up. There are many sinkholes in Ripon uh, that do not open up, but they're still affecting the buildings above it. Uh, so you can still see that in the data. Um, so this is this is useful for insurance companies. The next step uh, for these kind of applications would be to detect these kind of events at scale, um, solve the problem of when do you give off warnings, when does movement become critical, and, and like I said, how do you do this at scale automatically? Um, we are certainly not there yet. Uh, it's it's a big research uh, research topic. We've seen uh, time and time again here at Fringe, and I think. When we solve that problem as a as an INSAR community, I think that's the next big step in, in INSAR uptake for, for industry. Moving on to more in, uh, infrastructure applications. Um, so first a real, real example, uh, so Folkestone. So the photograph you see here is obviously not a recent photograph. It's taken in December 1915. Uh, quite a dramatic uh, landslip happened at the time. Derailing, uh, derailing a train and stopping, uh, stopping rail traffic in those days for for months. Um, that landslip. Step. Thank you very much. Uh, that landslip uh, still uh, is still ongoing, as we can see in our data here. Um, so at the top right, you see a, a horizontal vertical decomposition. This time, the arrows indicate uh, movement towards the sea. And you can clearly see uh, a big red hotspot at, uh, at the location of where this landslip happened and a big horizontal movement in the area as well. Time history of one of the points shows long-term movement going on. Um, the way this, this kind of data is useful for, for uh, network rail operators is, um, first of all, the, the fre frequency of acquisitions we get. Uh, network rail does their own monitoring, but is uh, quite infrequently. And network rail, um, so the UK rail operator is very much aware of what happens on, on their rail corridor itself, but it's not always very well aware of what happens either side of it in terms of landslides, mining activity, groundwater extraction. So providing that spatial context is another area, big area where INSAR contributes to their, to their knowledge and their strategic decision making. Uh, final. Example I have, uh, water utilities, uh, so both fresh and sewage water. Um, water utilities have a vast network of data to quite dated network, very much uh, centered on, on urban location, which is good for, for INSAR, of course. Um, there's limited maintenance bandwidth, so they, they famous quote from one of the water utilities, if they had to replace all of the pipe networks, it would take them several hundred years at the current rate, which is obviously not sustainable. Inspection is difficult and expensive. So the way what the utilities handle this is they, they rely on risk uh, risk modeling. So failure risk assessment to target their maintenance. Um, and large savings are possible by improving this, this risk modeling by uh, integrating better data into it. So we were lucky to receive funding through ESA's Artist Business Applications project for Project Drippin. I'm still quite proud of that acronym myself. Um, 
And the goal of this, uh, this project is really to integrate INSAR into uh, their risk modeling and their operational, uh, their operational workflows in terms of um, response to events, but also this long-term strategic decision-making of which pipes to maintain, which pipes to, to actively monitor with underground, uh, underground measurements. We're partnering with several water utilities in the UK uh, on producing these risk maps and the integration strategy, building the business case. All right, I'll finish off by saying that, by repeating that again, we're hiring. So you can contact me through these measurement, through these, uh, these me methods, and I'll answer any questions in the chat and or, and or be after the, the session is finished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Karsten, for this uh, overview of uh, of a wide variety of, uh, of of phenomena that can be detected, where inside processing is uh, is quite an enabler. Um, we're moving uh, ahead to the next presentation. Uh, Giovanni, please go ahead. Thank you, Guinea. Uh, uh, I would like also to invite the audience again to post questions if. Uh, if they have uh, for these interesting uh, presentations. The next presenter uh, is uh, Ivana Vla Vlabakova from uh, GISAT, uh, Czech Republic. Please, Ivana, go ahead. Yes, uh, I, hope, I hope you can see my presentation now. Yes, we can. Okay. So, good morning. Uh, my name is Ivana Halačva from GISAT in Czech Republic. And I'm here to present uh, our approach to handle nonlinear movements in in certain series. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the approach was designed for PSI monitoring of infrastructure, but as it uses only the time series information and nothing more, it is possible to be used also for land tax monitoring with SBAS or anything else. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are mostly processing Sentinel-1 data, and up to now we have um, a long time series of, of six to seven years with uh, 330 images right now. Uh, but with each new images, uh, there are less and less points uh, subject to linear movements and subject to constant noise and so on, with all the changes uh, which are happening uh, on the Earth. Uh, the inside community uh, usually measures the point quality uh, as a coherence. But our end users, which are not in the inside community, they are, they are usually geodesists or other geotechnical people or something else. Uh, they do not understand what is coherence. And also, uh, coherence does not help when uh, we need a decision if the point really moves or not. Uh, wait such a long time series, we can uh, set the coherence thresholds very low uh, down to 0 0.5 or even 0 0.4. There are still just a small amount of points which represent pure noise. Most of the points uh, with coherence 0 0.4 or 0 0.42 uh, have an important signal. And with every Coherence threshold, we uh, balance the important points with nonlinear movement, which leads to low coherence. And the number of points which represent pure noise but have randomly higher coherence. Uh, so, what are the low coherence points? Uh, these are points with noise uh, for the whole time series, which uh, need to be excluded from the interpretation. There are points with jumps, uh, points with noise uh, just in a part of the time series. And there are points with nonlinear movement, which often brings unwrapping arrows, such as here. And if we correct 
these other pink arrows, we get uh, we get something. We get even lower coherence. Here it dropped from 0 0.50 to 0 0.37, so it would be plotted out. And these phenomena are most important for our users. One even told me that he can tolerate the underpink errors, but he really doesn't want me to risk with this one. So uh, we uh, decided not to use coherent stretch holding anymore, uh, but we need a different point quality estimator for, in order to exclude. Uh, the noisy point. Uh, and if you process large areas and uh, it is not effective to split it into more periods and to process uh, separately the year 2017, separately the year 2018, or anything else. And if we have points with different types of movements, such as landslides and subsidence due to groundwater extraction and so on, we cannot even either uh, uh, split the area into more small areas it would be so ineffective. So we decided to split uh, the time series and uh, individually for each point. We are looking for uh, homogeneous slabs uh, homogeneous with regard to uh, noise and velocity. We require there are no jumps within a lab. There are, the jumps are only between the labs. And therefore, we get a piecewise linear model of movement where each piece has a, a defined minimum length, such as half year or year. The most difficult task is to find the breaks. And it is uh, also not very robust if we have uh, two neighboring points which are subject to, uh, to the same displacement. They may have a different break, break dates, and also for one we can find a jump, and for the other one we can find a um, difference in the velocity. Even if we do the significance test for the differences between the neighboring clubs. And for each lab, we estimate the reliability. I will now introduce the reliability uh, because we are passing um, our results to users uh, which have uh, no knowledge of NSAR. Uh, they also don't know that, um, they, they also don't understand the ambiguities and they don't understand that in this case, um, as the end of the uh, monitoring period is coherent, that the ambiguities in the first part of, uh, of the monitoring period are set in order to correspond uh, to the velocity uh, in the last part of the period. So if we just get them this time series, they would say the velocity is more or less constant for, uh, for the whole time period, but we have to say no, the velocity can be arbitrary here. We have no information about the velocity. Uh, so we define the reliability as the probability that less than 1% of the measurements are wrapped. That means they are different from the unwrapped values. Uh, we do simulations. Uh, here is the real noise uh, and here is rap noise. We do, uh, and this is a result of some simulations for Sentinel-1. And <coughs> we can see that from um, there's the discrepancy between the rap and unwrap uh, and unwrap uh, standard deviation starts somewhere at four and a half millimeters or one for two radians. And uh, we, all, we need to re relate the reliability with regard to the rep standard deviation as this is the only information we have uh, from the measurements. 
and we need the reliability to be independent on the number of samples because the number of samples is different for each lab. Uh, so I will get back to the piecewise linear model. Uh, it allows us to evaluate the displacement for a user-defined period, just for one year in the user vicious zone. It helps us evaluate dynamics, but we evaluate dynamics uh, only on reliable intervals. And we can see, we can say that if the point is accelerating or decelerating, or it's a more complex progress, combination of acceleration and acceleration. And we can also give the users uh, the information about the noise changes. And this is what they really want. So to summarize my presentation, uh, we split the time series into piecewise linear model uh, with homogeneous labs with regard to velocity and noise. And also there are no jumps uh, within each lab. Uh, and we, we can estimate the movement on a user-defined period. Uh, we evaluate reliability for each lab and exclude those which are not reliable or the reliability is, is below a threshold. Uh, we can evaluate the noise and coherence with regard to the model and this way we got a quality less or even not at all affected by the nonlinearity of the movement. Uh, finally, we exclude points which are not reliable for one year or for half a year. And in future, we are thinking about the redefinition of the reliability in order to be uh, less big function with, with the coherence of with standard deviation. And also, we would like to robustly aggregate uh, this information to promote track. And this is all for me for today. And if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Um, thank you, Ivana. Uh, uh, again, for the audience, uh, to the audience, if there are questions, uh, please post using the slide or uh, question and answers window. Uh, now, maybe we can uh, move on. Please, Kini. Yes, uh, let's move on to the last presentation of this uh, session. And that will uh, be given by uh, Chao Chuan Yin uh, from uh, Klausthal University of Technology. And uh, she will give a presentation on the quality assessment of ground movement components uh, derived by decomposition of cross-heading line of sight data sets. Please go ahead. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, I will share my screen now. Okay, I hope this. I hope you can see my presentation now. Is it? Oops. <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Xiao Xuan. Yeah. Yeah. The presentation is there. You're, okay, okay. So I can start. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you for your introduction again. And my name is Xiao Xuan Yin from Tewu Klaus Tai. As you already heard, I'm going to talk about an old school topic for us all that is deriving ground movements components by using decomposition of a cross heading line of site data set. But instead of going details about how we calculate them, we want to give you a brief on the quality of these two derived components and show you from the theoretical side which benefit we can get from um, this method at all. So in the last years, we uh, used INSAR method like PSI and SPONS increasingly to do the ground movement monitoring. Um, as we all know, that ground movement are 3D uh, deformation of a surface. That means the ground movement at each location are also including three components, that is the vertical one, height changes, and two uh, horizontal one, that is uh, usually in the eastern and northern uh, direction, to determine such deformation, um, single looking direction was used, 
The problem we all know is that the side looking radar data uh, sensor can only measure the distance changes between the sensor and uh, backscatter. That means the line of sight displacement we got from one single looking direction, it is the sum of the individual projected uh, each of the components. So instead of use just one looking direction, more and more people talk about to use ASENI and DSENI data set, that is the um, cross heading data set, to derive vertical and uh, eastern displacement as standard because of the excellent data access from Sentinel-1 mission. So just like this, um, well-known function shows us. So to show you these differences between the two mentioned methods, we have a, a simple uh, simulated um, situation here uh, from a simple subsidence trough. In the practice, for a subsidence trough, we will not only have the vertical uh, components, but also always the horizontal components. And if we use single line of sight measurement to derive the height changes, we will have to make the assumption that there are no horizontal displacement in the looking direction um, and use this um, function. So that means if we have ascending line of sight movements, um, we will get height changes from this, from this line of sight displacement like this one. And we can see it from the graphic that both of the, der uh, the derived height changes are not the same, like the um, simulated high, high change. And it is no matter if you use the descending or ascending, most of all, uh, both of the results are different to the simulated um, ground truth. And this difference is caused by our assumption and it is systematically error in our result. So for the practice side, we also calculated from ascending and descending data set for the same time interval and from the same area uh, of its subsidence from uh, the light each uh, from the single line of sight measurements. And you can see it here, uh, both of the results showing special differently um, results. And as we, as we know, because of the systematical error, both of them are not correct. So instead of use single line of sight uh, measurements, if we use the 2D decomposition by using the cross heading data set, we will have for the simulation situation, the uh, derived vertical components and eastern components, both of them are looking very similar to the simulated ground shoes with a little bit differences with it. And we also calculate them um, by combining our ascending and descending data sets we've shown before and um, on the grade points. And um, here we can see the vertical components and eastern west components are also showing the appearance of uh, what we are expecting, just like the simulation. So only with the graphic is, uh, of course, not enough to evaluate the quality, so that we want to we choose two aspects to evaluate the quality of these two derived uh, components um, from theoretical side. That is the precision and uh, correctness. I will show you this in with a, a simple example here. If we have the derived um, components on the grid, grid points. So from each of the grid points, we will have time series um, from the, for example, here, the vertical displacement. And we can see from the time series, they are still noisy, just like the input PSI data set. So um, we use an orthogonal polynomial model to adjust the time series um, with its trend function. And the standard deviation from that, from each of the observation we used to uh, evaluate the standard uh, statistical uncertainty and precision. And for the second aspect, um, as, we, as we just uh, mentioned before, so um, we disregarding the northern displacement with this 2D decomposition so that we will have um, a systematic deviation from our calculated result and the actual displacement. And this one, we will um, try to derive them from the calculation function. So starting with building differences between the uh, component itself and the calculation function we use from the 2D decomposition. And we will have this uh, systematic uh, deviation here um, with another function. And both of the function, such in the uh, derived height changes and eastern displacement, um, are showing the same 
uh, structure. That is one part, uh, just as uh, expected, is the unknown northern displacement. We are, we don't know that. And the other part is just depend on the constellation angles um, from which combination we use. That means if we know um, which combination we, we will use for the 2D decomposition, we can sum this part up with a, a, cons a constant number. And so we do it, um, sum it up with two uh, factor um, here, just like epsilon factor, which, which we have another use for the later investigation. So from the statistical uncertainty, um, because we want to use the standard deviation from uh, and calculate them from the result, um, we just use a propagation of uncertainty method uh, respectly to their calculation way. So we have also such structure and we can see it from this um, function that the statistical uncertainty of each of the components are depending on the uncertainty from the input data and also one part um, from the constellation uh, angles. So let's take Sentinel-1 data as an example. Um, we can calculate it, this um, part, which is only depending on the angles, and we will have a number interval. And this interval shows us that if we calculate it from the 2D decomposition, um, the height changes will include in a possible um, so a systematic deviation with a magnitude from 9 to 21 percent of the local um, unknown northern displacement. And this magnitude, uh, this error magnitude in the calculated eastern displacement will even smaller than 8 percent of the um, local northern displacement. And if we calculate the height changes from the one, uh, only one uh, looking direction, this systematic deviation will uh, have a magnitude from 58% to 100% of the horizontal displacement in the looking direction. And from the statistical uncertainty, it's also showing the same benefit for this 2D decomposition. That means um, if we calculate the height changes from the 2D decomposition, we will have a standard deviation, which is uh, smaller than a single line of sight data set, which is go into the calculation. And that means if we calculate it from uh, one lo single looking direction, this value, the standard deviation will be greater than that. And then we also find out um, if the incidence angle is smaller than uh, 45 degree, the calculated eastern displacement will have a greater um, standard deviation than the calculated height changes. To show this effect, we also calculated um, the standard deviation with our true value, uh, our test area. So here shows the standard mean value of the standard deviation of all of the uh, uh, PSI points from the decent and ascending results by 3.3 and 3.4 millimeter. And um, the calculated uh, mean value of the standard deviation um, on each uh, of all uh, grade points from the vertical and eastern displacement are also shown here. Both of them are smaller than the input um, data and the uh, eastern displacement are greater. And from the theoretical side, we use the uh, function we show of the last slide and calculated respectively this two uh, input data uncertainty and we got the same magnitude of the theoretical um, standard deviation of both of the components. So at last, we want to introduce advanced use of the epsilon, fa epsilon factor I uh, showed before to estimate a, a, stand a statistical deviation. So that means um, we know the combination before and we can calculate it, this epsilon factor with it um, and treat it like a constant number. So for our test area, this um, both of the uh, factors are showing like this with this value and we can see it the height changes has uh, almost the 10 uh, time bigger uh, epsilon factor than the eastern um, displacement and we can assume a, a a worst case northern displacement like for our test area we assume a large number of 50 millimeter uh, northern displacement and calculated a worst case uh, systematic error in our calculated um, result from the 2D decomposition. So that means by 50 millimeter in our case, we will have 
about seven uh, millimeter systematic error in our calculated height changes. And respectly, the expected height changes in this area, this could be significant. But for the calculated eastern displacement, the value will be uh, smaller than one millimeter. And respectly to the standard deviation we calculated before, this value will not be uh, significant so that we can treat the eastern displacement we calculated as fully correct. So let's um, sum it up from uh, our investigation. Um, we find out that the 2D decomposition enabled a high quality of uh, calculation from high changes and uh, eastern displacement by having lower statistical uncertainty and uh, significant smaller systematic error in it, especially compared with the use of the single line of sight um, measurements. And then um, both of the uh, aspects, the uh, statistical uncertainty are depending on the constellation angles and the uncertainty of the input data and the uh, systematical error are also depending on the constellation angle but also the unknown uh, northern displacement. And we also find out we can calculate it prior the epsilon factor, which only depend on the constellation angles and have a further use um, so that we can make such recommendation. If we have more uh, uh, data set to, to choose um, with which we build our combination to do the 2D decomposition. So we um, must choose or we should choose the combination with a smaller um, epsilon factor to have lower uh, systematical error in our, error, uh, our result. Just like for the uh, height changes, we need smaller incidence angle and uh, the azimuth looking direction should as close as possible towards eastern and western direction. And um, for the better eastern displacement from 2D decomposition um, without um, systematical error, we need um, the same incidence angle and similar opposing uh, azimuth direction of both of the uh, line of sight. So um, to reduce the statistical uncertainty in the high changes, we can use the same condition like uh, here uh, we talked before, but for the eastern displacement, we need greater incidence angle. So that is all from my side. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to have a discussion with you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, I see we are uh, well in time, so um, we can move ahead uh, with, uh, with uh, the question uh, part of this uh, session. Um, and then I will give the word uh, back to uh, Giovanni. Thank you, Guinea. Uh, I'm reading uh, in the chat. Uh, there were many questions, so some have been already answered by authors. Uh, from uh, starting from, uh, okay, maybe we can start with this. The last one, very long question, uh, Mariangela uh, is uh, asking, maybe, uh, no, no, this is not, yes. Uh, so a, a question for, for Tank, what is the minimum grid size of the localized deformation area that, uh, uh, that you can uh, monitor? And uh, how is this related to the SAR pixel resolution or dam resolution? You already answered it a little bit, probably you can add something more if you have. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, so the local deformation measurements is Yes, it's depending on the uh, resolution of the SAR images, particularly the interferogram. So we still use uh, some uh, slightly multi-loop interferograms. We use one, two, uh, one, two, four multi-looping factors for interferogram. And so uh, the resolution is about 20 meters per, per pixel. That's a grid size, grid size for the local deformation we are monitoring. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, I don't know, Guinea, you were also asking a question by yourself before. Probably you can uh, ask uh, directly to Karsten. Um, the question asked to Karsten uh, is uh, on, uh, well, nowadays we see uh, more uh, uh, nationwide uh, processing and all kinds of uh, different uh, phenomena. 
Um, and my question is, uh, does it have an effect on, uh, on governmental uh, uh, policies? Um, so we haven't had direct uh, influence on government policies. Uh, we've been involved in, in response to uh, some catastrophic events um, related to infrastructure and, and water barrier failures, things like that. And we provide data to, to infrastructure providers, regulators, uh, uh, environment agency, these kind of, which are government related agencies, I would say. So um, directly government agencies, no. Um, so not ministry or anything like that, but hopefully in the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, I had the same question to uh, to Giovanni Quazzo because uh, yeah, we saw this, uh, this, this nice overview of, of how integrated uh, uh, processing can uh, can can give you a, a good spatial temporal overview of uh, of landslides and, and rock glacier phenomena. And also here, I was wondering if uh, what what kind of effect does it have on, on risk management and, and mitigation measures? Thank you for the for the question, Hini. Um, the, the, our activity in, in this project was uh, strictly related with the local uh, government because it was funded by the province of, of Bolzano in the South Tyrol. But it is a, a, at the moment was a, especially a research uh, project. And uh, the main uh, things was to test this kind of uh, new uh, data and determine with, what are the uh, best technique and data to, the, to detect the movement in this area. Uh, we, after the project, we delivered this uh, report where there are this uh, um, guideline for this kind of uh, advice for the users. This was the, the output at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you to you. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, on my side a question to Ivana, uh, if I can. Uh, of course, in the chat, there are many other questions that have been already answered. Uh, the question is about, uh, I would say, the, uh, the clustering classification of the time series profiles. Can you add something more about, I don't know, the metrics that you are using to, to cluster? And if this can also be useful to uh, not only to identify areas with different uh, deformation behaviors, but also to mitigate atmospheric uh, artifacts, because you are also looking at uh, temporal behavior at that area. And so you can group pixels saving similar temporal behaviors. What do you think? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, we, we estimate the atmosphere before, uh, before having the time series. Uh, and it's a, it's a new idea to me, so I will have to think about it. And uh, what is the metric that they are using to to cluster to cluster to classify the profiles? The uh, distance. I'm not sure what you mean by bad metric. Uh, the distance to compute to to decide if two profiles are uh, in the same group, so to speak, if they are similar or not. Uh, we 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 classify each point uh, separately, and the clustering is. Um, plan for the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the, the chat. Also, there are... Okay, there is another question for, for Tank. What is the key differentiator of, the, of your machine learning uh, technique compared to existing methods? Uh, yes, it's a very good question. And uh, I think the key difference is uh, is that for machine learning or deep learning methods, we are trying to solve the problem that's easy for our human eyes but difficult to computers. For example, for, for, for the local deformation detection, when we are looking at an interferon, I think it's clear for us to find the local deformation areas. But on the other hand, it's difficult to set up a single threshold or design a compute, computer algorithm to find them. For such problems, I think it's it's good uh, for the deep learning method, right, to, to, to learn such patterns like humans and to detect such local deformation. That's also for the face unwrapping problems. Sometimes we look at the fringes, it's clear, or it's not so clear with noises, but we, we, we as a human being, 
we still can see there is some fringes there, so we we, we can get the 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 uh, what it look like should look like for the unwrapped faces. But again, it's very difficult for compute uh, compute uh, for 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 algorithm for the computer to do such job. And that's why I think I designed such a deep learning networks to learn these features and to get the unwrapped interferograms, particularly for this kind of for local high gradient deformation with dense fringes with high level of noises. And I think uh, that's a main differences uh, between main difference between the deep learning based method and the uh, traditional method. Thank you, Tank. There is also a question for uh, Xiao Xuan Yin. Uh, have you looked at other scenarios such as uh, two incidence angles or three stacks? Okay, thank you for your question. That is uh, an interesting question. I also uh, looking for other scenarios. I think I will start with the two instance angle. I think you mean by we have the same looking direction, but a uh, uh, different incidence angle. So both of this um, situation, we have really bad um, geometry for the solution of the uh, function system so that um, it is, it's not providing a good uh, result. Um, for the other part, the three stacks or more, we're also looking at that, but without two, uh, the three, three stacks, if we, if we use um, the uh, available data set from Sentinel-1 or something, we will also have the same problem, just like we have the uh, two incidence angle with the same looking direction. And then uh, it is also the same problem. The result will be really uh, this, this um, function system to, to solve. Um, for the two three components are um, a bit ill conditioned, and then we cannot get um, good results. Um, first of all, the precision will be really lower, and um, we cannot guarantee that we have the right um, components from that. And um, maybe the solution for that we are also consider is just um, um, doing uh, modeling before that. Maybe we can have something better. Out. Okay, thank you, uh, Yin. Uh, I have also a, a comment on this. Do you think that uh, uh, um, the areas where there is overlap between different uh, 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 footprints can be can benefit your method? Because in that case, in principle, if I understand correctly, there could be for the same area different uh, incidence angles when there are different passes, so there is uh, the overlap between the scenes. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I also mean by that, because um, if we have the problem is if we have the same uh, azimuth looking direction mm -hmm. and uh, different incidence angle from the satellite we have now, we can um, maybe the greatest uh, angle differences between the incidence angles we can have is about 10 degree. And that makes mm -hmm. our uh, function for the solution from these two uh, components we can also calculate them, but um, this function system is EU conditioned so that we cannot um, get the precision uh, result from it. I think okay. I can, it you. cannot prove. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your comment, uh, Ian. And then, Okini, there are uh, more yes. questions. Well, I can continue because uh, I have an additional question for Xiao uh, Zhuan. Um, have you uh, actually uh, uh, cross-validated, for example, with, uh, with uh, a GNSS uh, measurements where you have uh, uh, the northeast uh, up uh, uh, components? Um, thank you for <laughs> the question again. So um, for this investigation, we don't have any, uh, any GPS, unluckily, but for the investigation we are making now, uh, I have a comparison for that. And uh, it shows a good result. I don't know if, should I share my screen again? <laughs> I have to see images. <laughs> you know, it's all, all right. Uh, yeah, th thanks for your answer, because it would be interesting <laughs> okay. to see. Uh, and uh, I think it's very worthwhile because we have more and more data coming in and, and you're looking um, into the actual uh, statistical uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that is also my, my, my further question. Um, Eventually, uh, because it's quite uh, uh, a complex uh, um, uh, um, yeah, material, and, and of course, if you don't know the, the north-south components and you do not have other data, yeah. uh, how, how would you eventually um, 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 
translated to the external public who is going to use these uh, European ground motion uh, services. Uh, yeah, what, how they should interpret uh, the data uh, mm -hmm. regarding to the uncertainty. I can understand that really good because um, this investigation we made uh, actually was aimed to use the data which not costing anything. And um, that means for most of the uh, area, we don't have DNSS data or leveling data at all. Um, and we can just give the other people a overview about which risk or we don't have any risk with this method. And um, with our investigation, we want to show the other people. So sure, we want to, we, we should use the 2D decomposition method. And we have such benefit uh, about 20% of the error um, um, from, from if we use the single looking direction. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's indeed, it uh, would be good indeed to translate uh, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much <laughs> for your answers. Um, then browsing to the other questions, I believe there's still a question for uh, Karsten. Um, let me see. There is a group of three between 1010 and 1014. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so, so Karsten, there's uh, one question. Uh, you mentioned removal of uh, points with, with fading signal of, uh, phase bias. Uh, the question is what kind of method you use for this? Yeah, so I answered this question partially in the, in the chat yeah. uh, already, uh, but good to discuss it here as well. Um, so what we do is uh, we reject points that are affected by this. Um, the way we go about this is we, um, we look at a set of metrics related to point quality, average temporal baseline, a number of interferograms in the network, uh, things like that uh, to separate points that are affected from points that are not affected in a statistical way. So we're correcting, we're not correcting affected points, we're rejecting them at the moment. Um, Ideally, we want to move towards correction. Um, that's, that's something where we're looking into quite frantically because it would, of course, uh, improve our, our coverage. We're losing we're losing coherent measurement points now because they're affected by this phase bias. Uh, but there is information in there, so we would like to retain that. Um, but we haven't we haven't found a reliable way of of either correcting or solving the problem altogether. That is. Um, efficient enough to, to also keep your data up to date in the real time. It's uh, all of the other limitations we're working with. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of, of, of um, correcting it or, or avoiding the problem altogether. We haven't found one that's fast enough, uh, efficient enough to do this at sufficient scale to, to uh, do this operation. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and then uh, I have one last question uh, that to pose for the session, and that is uh, for Teng Wang. It's on computational efficiency. So the question is, how does the computational efficiency of your method compare to the other methods? And can it handle sparse spatial data? Uh, okay. Yeah, the computational efficiency is very uh, it's very high. After training, the network can solve the problem very fast, uh, particularly for this local uh, with a small area with a, a complicated fringes. It's much I, I would say it's much faster. About I think average is about four times faster than than Stanford. But the the the, the RIP method uh, implemented in the gamma software is also fast. I think. But it's uh, still com comparable with, uh, with, with, with that. Okay, uh, thank you for, uh, for your answer. Um, you. We're almost uh, at the hour, at 11 o'clock. Um, so I would like to start uh, closing the session. Giovanni, did you want uh, to? Yeah, uh, maybe we can ask the audience if they have uh, a, any a recommendation that we can uh, pass to ISA during the technical session. Uh, I don't know, for, so for the two presenters that are uh, presenting the services provided by companies. So, okay, uh, I think that we can close this session. Uh, this uh, session. Uh, thank you to all the presenters and uh, goodbye. Yes, oh. thank you very much. Interesting topics and uh, see you in the other sessions today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.